And by 1900, 1910, New Haven is a thriving, bustling industrial city and dealing with the problems of all cities at that time, congestion, traffic congestion. Now, in some sense, congestion is good because congestion means there's action, there's activity, there's economic uh, stuff going on. So congestion, in some ways, is a good thing, right? But too much of it is a bad thing because uh, the city elders, um, the leaders of the, of, the, of the leading businesses and the politicians too, and of course there's overlap there because often leading politicians are also associated with leading businesses. They want to figure out a way to fix congestion, to put new roads in, to build new kinds of roads. And we begin to get this movement towards, towards the highways, right? And towards urban renewal, which in some sense is New Haven's great trauma. Um, and they say, these people shouldn't have to live this way. And it is in their best interest, our best interest, to seize that land by eminent domain. Now they would ask you if you would sell. They would, they would offer to buy your house, but you didn't have a choice. They were claiming it from you. They were taking it from you. Now the basic idea of eminent domain is that it is in the public interest to take that land and repurpose it for other uses. And in the 50s, they decided for Oak Street that it was in the public interest to take what we would call a neighborhood today that they call the slum and turn it into a highway and create these new big, big blocks, these new big places to develop, uh, which is what I started off by talking about. And you have the big players come in, telephone. Uh, that was SNET. Um, that was Southern New England Telephone Company. Uh, that, in my view, from an, just from architecture, is one of our most elegant you know, skyscrapers, actually, the, the, uh, the 1930s building. Um, the one uh, next to it on the corner right there, um, with, the, with the golden cupola that stakes out the corner of Elm Street, uh, Elm and Church. That's the Union, bless you, Zente. That was the Union, <coughs> that was the Union Trust Building. That was the Union, Union and New Haven Trust Building, a big bank. Those two buildings, in my view, are like the most, that's like the height of urbanism um, of the early 20th century. Very kind of, uh, I mean, in my view, it's like an aesthetic choice now, kind of elegant buildings that were all about downtown being an important place to, to do business. Okay. And you would go and you would tip your cap and kind of engage in uh, this very formalized style of public life that would happen here on the green in the 19th century. Okay. So that's all, that's all happening there. In the 20th century, um, and, and after, after urban renewal, the idea of urban renewal was how can New Haven survive in the landscape of suburbs and highways? And New Haven said, we need to build exactly what I've been talking about, our own highway link, our own highway connector, to make us as important in this new metropolitan landscape. Is this making sense? In other words, now there are suburbs. So middle class people and white people, because racism is a part of this, there's no doubt about it, they're moving off to the suburbs. Um, there is limited or uneven distribution of mobility. Not everyone has mobility. And we need to hit head on the fact that the history of American cities has not only been about inequality based um, on income, but also inequality based on race. And that's a whole nother conversation. That's still a part of our cities today. But in the 50s, um, access to the suburbs was not evenly distributed, not only based on income, but also based, based on race. And we can talk, we can talk more, more about that. It, it was an insidious and ugly part of American history, but it's uh, of, of 20th century urban history. But it's there. Yeah. They, Please. Called, they called it white flight. Mm -hmm. Or people got jobs, there's more jobs. Women were actually put out of jobs mm -hmm. because they'd taken on jobs during the war. Mm -hmm. So there's more wealth, and so they could buy cars, and then they could buy homes, and there would be the American dream That's right. of buying the white picket fence house. And so everyone moved out of the cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And I think that's what you guys think have some similarity to some of the movements that are going on now of people speaking out against all of the all of the moves that had happened in the fifties and sixties. And the big event that I want to bring it to your, your attention to now on the green happened in nineteen sixty nine, um, when there was a trial of Black Panthers here in New Haven. You know the story too. There, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Dad, my, my dad was there. Yeah. He was. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was um, at the CIA at Albertus mm -hmm. Culinary Institute of America, and there were riots. Mm -hmm. He talks. He, he talks of riots and how he. Yeah, that's right. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It didn't turn out that way so much, did it? And in fact, what some people say is that all of that um, kind of countercultural instinct that was being fostered in the late '60s was commodified in some way. 
that you could commodify your descent by buying particular kinds of clothing, by buying particular kinds of cars. The, the Madison Avenue people were extremely effective at converting all of that angst and anger and desire to fight the system into lifestyle choices in some sense. And I think that, that we have to be um, cognizant of that and not allow that kind of co-optation to happen this time around when so many places are beginning to express themselves in, in, these, in these different ways.